childhood, but all of us in that situation. And... The fuck? <laughs> God, I love my neighbors. <laughs> I don't even know where to pick up from that. Before treatment, I spent a lot of time by myself and in my room. I was in my studio apartment. I lived alone. I used to stay in my room and keep, keep it as dark as possible. I didn't trust nobody. I was secluded. Like, I would literally be in a dark space, this darkness. I didn't want no light around me. I just felt like I was hopeless. I did have a hard time having relationships. I withdrew from everybody. For someone like me, who tends to spend way too much time overthinking what appears obvious to others, but also for the general and new fans of Guilty Gear, the inclusion of lyrics within character themes was quite welcome. At first, it was just because the songs sounded great, even separated from their source material, which is true of pretty much every soundtrack of the series. Uh, further on, for myself and other people with the insane need to just fucking understand what the shit is happening in Guilty Gear, then the inclusion of lyrics promised a new layer to pull apart the characters and the wider world. For once, we got a close inner look at the turmoils and pains that each of these characters went through, and a path to understand why they act the way they do. The lyrics gave us unfettered access to the inner thoughts and desires of each of these characters, unfiltered and raw as they were. We got a good example of Potemkin's wavering faith, of Baikin's shift away from revenge, of Zato's self-hatred for the pain he's given his compatriots, and even Leo's suicidal tendencies. For us morons who believe that Daisuke actually has a plan, rather than the probable reality that he's just shoving cool shit into his world, the themes gave us more room to expand possible interpretations on how the entire ecosystem worked. However, I believe that there is one nasty trick that has been played on us, the audience. If one is given full access to the inner thoughts of a character, then one has a natural assumption underlying their voyeurism into the soul. After all, if one knows what exists in the minds of those around them, then they would find thoughts and feelings that they were previously incapable of seeing. For once, there would be a level of honesty that isn't obtainable by the average person. After all, a conversation that is held within oneself could only be one that doesn't play the games of normal relationships or of society in general. There is no need to lie, even if it is a little white lie, told for the benefit of keeping the peace. After all, how can one hide one's lies from themselves? My name's Skylar. I was in the Army, active duty, six years. I think the overall experience of being in a combat zone um, stays with you forever. I think my vehicle got blown up directly, maybe four times, and indirectly, you know, a handful of times. So I think there's like an anxiety that sticks with you about stuff like that. Getting out of the military, it's, it's scary, you know, because you have this whole life that you learned. Um, for me, it was six years active duty uh, in an infantry unit. Now I have to all of a sudden go be a civilian. I didn't have any army buddies around, so I didn't have people that I could talk to and hang out with. And I kind of felt alienated um, from the civilian world because I didn't share anything in common. When I got out, I didn't think that I had PTSD, you know? I almost thought like PTSD was something that people who couldn't handle the intensity of their job had. Um, and when I got out, I didn't think that I had any issues or, or, or mental health issues that would affect me in the civilian life. I found that I was having trouble controlling my emotions sometimes, my anger, um, my frustrations. It was easier for me to get frustrated. And when I did get frustrated, I took it more seriously as if something serious was going on. If I was running late to a movie, I felt like I was running late to a mission and people's lives were at stake. Uh, but that wasn't the reality. That, that personality characteristic, that intensity, that drive makes you succeed in the military, but it doesn't in the civilian world. It alienates you. And I had to, had to back off and, and let that go. And that was hard. Um, it was, it took 
it took a lot of other people coming up to me and telling me, hey, I think you have PTSD, or hey, I think that you have things going on that you need to talk about or you need help with. I said, no, I don't think I have PTSD. What could I have PTSD from? And I was always thinking there has to be some specific event. I don't have a constant nightmare where I wake up and I'm reliving a specific situation. I'm not constantly bunkered down in my house behind sandbags, you know, waiting for the invading army to attack. No, I don't have any of those things going on. But there is something kind of wrong, you know? I do have this, this agitation, this anxiety, this hypervigilance from time to time. Maybe, maybe something's not right. At this point, the assumption that I wish to dissuade should be somewhat apparent. What I wish to dispel is the assumption that unfettered access to the inner thoughts of these characters means that we are getting the honest thoughts of these characters. In particular, I believe that one character specifically shows the mistake of this assumption, and that there is a good chance that we have missed a terrible tragedy underlying the surface. This character is Giovanna. To begin with, it is best that we are clear on the information that we do know about Geo, true or embellishment, before we begin to speculate on what's hidden within the lyrics. There are only three sources we can trust as definitive, which is the story mode of Guilty Gear, the arcade mode, and the lore that is posted within our character page. The page is a good place to start as it's fairly quick and easy. Two of the facts that are present are about her job and the still unexplained relationship between Geo and Ray. They are interesting, but the third fact is worth noting for the other two sources we will be examining. It states, quote, she's careful with her words, but still manages to come off as rude and irreverent due to her attitude. Deep down, though, she means well. She's especially friendly with children and animals, end quote. I may be overemphasizing this point, but I believe that this statement ought to be kept in mind when it comes to everything else. With this single sentence, we get a stark difference between what she intends within herself and what her actions tend to come across as. She means well, but comes off as rude and irreverent. This relationship between what she wishes to convey and how others perceive it is one of the most important pieces of information, especially when it comes to understanding trigger and all the other elements later on. From here, let's look at the information that we have within the arcade mode of Strive. Now, it must be kept in mind that the events of the arcade mode occur after the events of the story mode. While this may appear out of order, there is good reason to show the information now before the events of the story mode, where we receive very little information regarding Geo. This, as far as I can tell, is the most honest Geo is regarding where she came from and her underlying nature. However, there are multiple routes to the arcade mode, depending on a few conditions, and each route has different dialogue. So, credit where it's due, I attempted to get the footage using the English dub, but I'm already a below average player when it comes to Strive, and playing AI, which can't think and I can't react to, it's just not fun. And then when you get to the boss and they get full body, full body invulnerability, no drain on blood state, they can fucking read what direction I'm blocking to perfectly mix me up with a low the moment I think they're about to do an overhead. It just, it, yeah, I'd, I'd rather just keep losing online, thank you very much. So the footage for the arcade mode is from Crimson Contrast, who had the fucking patience to get the footage for every base character's arcade mode. Uh, dude has far more patience than I ever will. Anyway, we'll only be focusing on a few pieces of dialogue here, so if you want to see the entirety of the arcade story, uh, check out his video. あんた、本当はまあそうです。あなたとは考え方は違うかもしれませんが、侍を助けるんだな。なら一緒に行くよ。あなたの心配わかりますよ。多分おおむね目的は同じです。なんかそうみたいだな。ちょっと誤解してた
俺に何を解く気だもしも人間に戻れたらって聞く気だったでもそんなのここにいるみんな簡単に答えられない積み上げた業をなかったことにして考えるのは難しいですからだからシンプルに名刺を置いていきます食いぶちに困ったら一声かけてくださいこの陶器俺に何を伝えようとしている戦闘で伝わったと思いますがあなたは自分と似てますまあ就職先に困ったら一声かけてください似ているかこの陶器俺を救う気かよかった伝わったみたいですねこの俺の深淵を見ても同じことが言えるか大げさですねそんなの初めて会った時に見てます今さら俺を救うことなどできん何年か前自分もそのセリフ言ったことあります廃墟が家で拾った T シャツ着て知らないおじさんが隣にいました何だって変わります俺が変わればの話だ From the arcade mode story, we managed to get one solid piece of evidence regarding Geo's background, and several statements that allude to a particular mindset of hers. What led her to being in that cabin, who that man was, and how she got out of there, we don't know. All we know was that, in her mind, this was the result of a lifetime of sin, and that she felt that she was past saving. Clearly, though, whatever got her out of that situation made her believe that it is possible to escape that abyss. Hence, why she sought out Nagoriyuki and gave him a potential avenue for himself. There are also two things to note from Axel's lines. First, he misunderstood her intentions, but Geo made it clear through fighting. This mirrors some of what Nago said, as he also picked up that Geo was trying to communicate through the fight rather than with words. Second, Axel says that becoming human is impossible for any of us. Nago is a knightless. Which is Daisuke's crazy fucking way of just saying, just say vampire, god damn it. <laughs> And Axel has essentially ascended to godhood, but any of us in that situation includes Geo. So she isn't human. Then what the fuck is she? Does it relate to Rey? Is it. The reason she led a lifetime of sin and believed herself beyond. It just, just give me a fucking break. <laughs> yeah, it's basically all the important information from the arcade mode. Honestly, some of it brings more questions than answers, but what we do get will help when it comes to understanding Trigger later on. Anyway, on to the story mode. Fortunately, or I suppose unfortunately, if you were hoping for more, we only have two scenes that help us understand Geo as a character. So let's start with the prologue. Chief, Secretary Dickinson has already arrived. That's why we're in such a hurry. Honestly, I'm not sure if this whole exercise is really worth our time. I mean, the Secretary is stronger than all of us agents combined. Yeah, and he's pissed off that we let the gear maker into the compound. Being late may cost us some trust, sure. But skipping this training would cost us our lives. Tell that to Geo. A little early for moon watching, isn't it? It's too gloomy indoors. It'll get a lot gloomier if you piss off the secretary. Come on, we've got a training exercise to get to. You recommended me for the Secret Service, remember? I read the brief. I know what I'm doing. Oh? Did it say anything about paying you to take a nap? You're so much stronger than I am, yet you still haven't earned this badge. Why is that, Giovanna? Because it looks incredibly stupid. I don't disagree. But don't go around saying that, got it? This was designed by the president himself. Did he design that ugly shirt, too? Enough already. Just prepare for your training. And button up your shirt. But then how will I catch a good man? <sighs> sure didn't work on me. 
this scene is a bit vague, but we do get some important pieces of information. First, Geo is considered one of, if not the strongest, member of the Secret Service, but it's not a full-fledged member for some reason. Likely because she does the minimal amount of work possible, such as actively avoiding training sessions. Uh, second, the other member of the Secret Service doesn't seem to have a high opinion of Geo. Third, the reason Geo has this job is because of the boss, however that situation happened. Did he find her in Iguazu, or was it sometime later, assuming she left at one point? We don't know. But obviously the boss has respect for Geo, and enough respect to put up with her frustrating tendencies. Now, here is where I'm laying down some speculating groundwork. Which is to say, don't take this as the absolute interpretation, but what I read from this scene, and why I think it gives us good insight into Gio's character. When the boss starts berating her for lazing off, Gio goes quiet, which to me seems to be a regular avoidance tactic from somebody who is trying to get out of a question they don't want to answer. Instead, focus is directed to the boss's badge, and we see a rather touching moment where the boss actually shows some sympathy towards Geo, hoping to get her to open up a little. Her response is to deflect that with derisive humor, which the boss takes in stride, mostly probably because he's now used to her tendency to avoid serious questions in that particular manner. If I had to make a guess from the little other information we have, this is likely the most open she is with anybody. Hell, with Axel in arcade mode, she almost appears to want to end the conversation as soon as possible and just move the fuck on. Here, at least, she's using some humor, even if it's not the healthiest and tends to frustrate others. The boss is likely one of the few people that she feels comfortable enough with to even be this way, with the president being another, at least in the story mode. Again, this is just my reading of the scene in conjunction with all the other information that we get about Geo, so don't take it as gospel. Uh, anyway, let's check out the next scene. Geo! You're not hurt, are you? Only my pride. Kai. Lael. I just got footage from the scene. They've captured Chaos. Good. What a relief. Are the surveillance cameras back up? Some of them. Why? I'd appreciate it if you could tell me where my boss is napping. I can't tell who's who. Will they ever recover from all this? I certainly hope so. Because I really don't want to hold on to that stupid badge as a memento. <laughs> uh -huh. What's wrong? Uh, is that badge you mentioned a cartoony star by any chance? How did you guess? Uh, well, just hold on a moment. Hey, rewind that real quick. Right away, sir. There. What about it? Was it the security chief's jacket he stole? No, it was Udo's. Chaos is able to freely manipulate people's appearances. The newbies' badges don't look nearly oh, that shit. dumb. Chaos is still inside the White House. Now, there isn't much direct information about Geo that we get from this scene, but I do believe that it's a continuation of the elements that I was speculating on in the previous scene. Geo, clearly battered and needing assistance to hold up, deflects concern about her well-being with a joke. Then the first thing she asks for is to find her boss, who, again, seems like one of the few people she trusts. When Leo questions whether any of them will make it out, Gio's response is another derisive joke about the badge, and barely scratches on the idea that her boss is dead. It's a pretty fucking dark joke, all things considered. Again, this is my reading, but taking Vernon's look in the background, who is another person she seems to relax around, he seems to be able to tell that she is not okay, and he clearly looks worried for her. Overall, the pattern of deflection and rude humor seems to be one of the most noticeable aspects of Geo's social proclivities. 
regardless, that's really all the information that we have regarding Geo as a character. It's not much, but there is enough that I feel confident in drawing parallels with some outside information. So, it's time for a bit of a detour. It's going to be kind of a long one, but you'll see what I'm building towards when we get to Trigger itself. Ego mechanisms of defense, postulated by Sigmund Freud and later expanded upon by Anna Freud, are adaptational changes that people tend to make as a result of the various stresses and whims of life. Nowadays, we tend to use the term defense mechanism, uh, mental adaptation, or probably most popularly, uh, coping mechanism. To butcher the near century of literature on the subject, these mechanisms can be best summed up as the behaviors and attitudes that people adopt in order to best secure themselves among an ever-changing world. They exist over a very wide range of adaptation, and some are beneficial while others are detrimental, at least depending on context. To go with an extreme example, a near-death experience could bring forward behaviors that increase risk or reduce risk. Somebody in a near-fatal car accident could take up alcohol to dull the pain, could find a new thrill in risk and take up gambling, could use the experience to isolate themselves in order to write poetry, they could drop their current job and pursue their dream job, they could decide to risk all of their finances on that dream business they wanted to start. How people adapt to situations is multifaceted, and it's still one of the most controversial topics to date, so I won't try to put down any concrete moral claims on what adaptations are, good or bad. But there is plenty of work done to try and classify adapted behavior, for which I will be borrowing George Vylon's categories of defense mechanisms. Uh, as a side note, I actually tried to figure out how to pronounce Violent's name, but, uh, I, no joke, the only point where I could actually find somebody saying his name out loud, they called him Valiant. And Harvard psychiatrist George Valiant is here to share with us some of what he found in that study. Welcome. Which is not how it's fucking spelled, um, but it makes sense, given that uh, Violent is the French word for Valiant. So I'm just going to go with the French pronunciation, because it's it's the only thing I could figure out. There is the wiki page, which apparently says that it's Valent, which I, I'm going with Violent. It's pretentious enough that I, <laughs> I have fun with it. Um, but again, uh, to oversimplify and butcher the actual research, Vylon is involved, or was involved, in the Grant study, which is an ongoing study of the behavioral changes of 268 Harvard men that attended between 1942 and 1944. In 1977, Vylon published his book, uh, adaptation to Life, which was one of the major publications to come from the study. It wasn't his only publication on the study, but it's one that is still referenced in papers today, so I'm confident that its categorizations still have some value. If you have any, uh, any interest in psychology, I'd recommend the book. Uh, there are certainly points that are outdated and controversial, but it is generally considered to be a solid piece of work, so take from it what you can. In Adaptation to Life, Violent groups the defense mechanisms of people into four distinct categories, or levels one to four. Uh, level one is the level of psychosis, while level four is the level of mature and healthy defense mechanisms. Essentially, the lower the level of psychic defense, the more likely it is to induce harm to the individual and others. It doesn't guarantee that somebody with level 4 defenses will be a model citizen, or that somebody with level 1 defenses are completely destructive. It's more that the odds of maladaptive behavior increases as the level decreases. In particular, I want to point towards behaviors that exist within level 2, and I believe that Vylon explains it best. Quote, for the user, these mechanisms usually alter distress caused by other people, either their presence or their loss. When these defenses are used to resolve conflict among conscious reality and instincts, the integration is imperfect. Anxiety may be avoided, but for the beholder, immature defenses 
appear socially undesirable, profoundly inconvenient, and may be labeled misbehavior. The user, however, is rarely aware that he has problems. End quote. In short, level 2 behaviors are often the behaviors of those who may appear normal, but often result in others seeing the person as rude, insensitive, obnoxious, or just the behaviors of a fucking asshole. There is plenty more that comes from the Grant study and from Vylon himself, but I believe the viewer might be getting an idea of where I'm going, so I won't waste time. Rather, if you'll remember, there were a couple of interviews that appeared earlier on. These were from people who were veterans of combat and had been suffering from PTSD or shell shock, as I still like to call it. There are a few more interviews that I'd like to share, some from veterans and some from homeless individuals. Uh, skip them if you wish, as they don't particularly prove anything, but I believe that seeing how this sort of behavior manifests in real living human beings can help demonstrate the sort of mental defenses that build up from somebody who goes through serious trauma. In other words, I believe that they will help somebody understand what I believe Geo as a character reflects from reality. Everybody knew me as just the happiest dude. Even in the Marine Corps, I was always like, you know, the funny dude making everybody laugh. But there was a time where there was just no laughing. In the war zone, he had a different mind frame. And he just kind of forced himself to become desensitized to a lot of things so that he could cope and do his job. On my second deployment, I got hit three times. Four bombs uh, hit my vehicle. This is what I was wearing when I got blown up. And uh, that's my blood from the IED, from my face. Yeah, that was nuts. In order for me to survive in that environment under those extreme emotional conditions where I was just living in fear, living with anxiety, I had to go emotionally numb. Unfortunately, when he returned, it all kind of came out and was on top of him. I didn't realize how messed up I was until I got back to America. I started having pretty horrible nightmares and that I couldn't focus on anything. I was having constant flashbacks. The whole time I was awake, I was miserable. I was angry. I found that we were fighting more and I was, I was thinking, you know, we don't get to see each other often. Why are we fighting? I couldn't feel any excitement about life, nothing. I stopped listening to music. I stopped uh, talking so much to my friends. I isolated myself. I would just stay in my room all day and just drink and drink and drink and drink. And I didn't know why. He tried hard not to shut off from me, but he was shut off. You're telling me that I'm a dysfunctional person because I'm living like this, or they're telling me, or making it appears that way because I'm living like this, and then expect to send me out into the real world, so-called, to function amongst normal people and compete in a job market where I'm an older dude. What I do know is you shouldn't be living here. That's right, that's the first step. That's the first step, and then who knows? Maybe I'm the phenomenal pe person that we've been waiting for. <laughs> I just hadn't been discovered. <laughs> Anyways, I gotta try to make a little light of things because if not, I'll be walking around scaring people. Yeah. I don't like homeless people, so I don't, you know, I'm social uh, outcast. Uh, I don't hang around my people and the norms don't accept us too much. Um, so I'm a loner and it's lack of social stimulation it caused me, it's causing me to have uh, symptoms. The home life wasn't too bad. I mean, my kids understood, you know, it was kind of okay. My youngest one would kind of laugh about it. She was real proud. You know, she was real like, you know, my daddy, my daddy, you know, and, and they would laugh about it because the way I would drive when I came home and stuff. But, you know, and then, and then I think as time went on, they started to see the, the, the nasty side of it. You know, I'd come home and I, I didn't have a lot of patience. And I still don't have a lot of patience for people. And they would see that side of it. And they would see me, you know, why didn't you do this? There was no, like, um, middle ground. It was just like zero to 100, yelling, mad, upset, couldn't handle it. 
And the hard part for me was the whole time I'm doing this, I knew in my inside it was wrong, but I couldn't stop it. And I think that was the big thing for them that maybe affected them. Where I really started to feel it was when I went back to work, you know, and I noticed um, going back to work for me was really, really hard. I felt like people were looking at me like I was strange, like something was off. And I don't know if it was something personal that was going on inside of me, um, but I just started to feel really isolated. And, you know, some of the counselors have told me that was probably my own, you know, kind of like feeling that way was something was going on inside of me. People usually don't just look at people like that. And so I kind of isolated myself at work. I'd go in really early, I'd sit in the dark, do my work, and leave. You know, I'd have a lot of social interaction at work. Um, there was times I would just leave work and I would walk down the middle of our, you know, corridor thing. And, uh, you know, I would just, people would be walking at me and I'd walk right down the middle and I'd just think to myself, don't hit me, don't touch me. If you touch me, I'm putting you down. You know, and I've tried to adapt and I tried to kind of function as a normal person, but, you know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't crave that normalcy that I had one at one time, you know, because I don't have it anymore. Tony. Yes. You're homeless in New York City. Yes, I am. Tell me about it. Homelessness in, in New York City is, uh, is very hard. You have to be a seasoned individual to make it through these streets. Because if you're not seasoned, if you're not tough, if you don't have it in you to make it in, uh, in to sleep in the streets at night, then the streets will eat you up immediately. And you will succumb to drugs. You'll be a drug addict. You'll be nothing but a drug addict, a prostitute. You'll be messed up in these streets. They will eat you alive. So you have to be strong. It's hard to do homeless sober. It's hard to do. Homeless sober is, 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 blood getting, is, is, is like getting blood from a stone. That's how rare that is. Yeah. The rarity. Yeah. You People don't see don't no. Understand that. You, there's no. There's no way you can do this without drinking or getting high on drugs or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You know, so I have to be very clean. I'm very, very, very punctual in my things. Yeah. I, like everything, everything has to be perfectly right. Yeah. You know, so that's why I stay alone, because I'm scared to be with people, because they're going to rob me and take my things, might even kill me. When I was homeless, I stayed alone, too. I think it saved me. It, it, that's what's saving me right now. That's the only thing that's saving me, is being with people. Because everyone is on this heroin out here. Fentanyl is killing all the homeless people left and right. I mean, I'm walking past dead people in the train stations, because they OD'd, and I can see that they OD'd, and it gets me scared, because I don't want to be that person. And I can see myself succumbing to that because it's so easy for these individuals to manipulate. Right, because you want to escape the pain because it's so horrible out here. It hurts being out here. Literally hurts. Hands hurt, cold. Yeah. Look, my hands are dirty from the train. I haven't washed my hands. I'm, I, that's not me. I grew up, I had a good childhood. I went to Catholic school, I graduated, had a great life. And ever since I got shoved in the train tracks, my life has changed. Yeah. It, that's one of the strangest things I've come across here. I've had shoes that are completely worthless and stink so bad somewhere and someone still takes them. Um, but it's also sharpened me. I don't miss a beat. There isn't too much. I'm, I'm pretty in tune with everything and everyone around me. Um, I'm a lot more aware than they are, I, I, I assume. Um, People I've, who have spent time on the streets are very aware of their surroundings. You have to be. You have to be, because if not, your surroundings will get you. I didn't have time for fools, I always said to myself. and, and uh, I thought nobody understood me. Um, I thought I was alone, and really, actually, for the most part, I was alone. Now, to tie up all the background, let's do a bit of a recap on what we know about Geo. She believed that she lived a life full of sin, and at one point felt unforgivable. That life had her, at one point, living in a mountain shack in tatters, essentially homeless. She was eventually brought into the Secret Service by her boss reaching out to her, however that happened. She appears friendly, but is derisive and rude to both her boss and Vernon, even to the point of making light of either of their potential debts, even when she performs her job as best as she can. Those around her find her frustrating, even her boss, who appears to tolerate and understand her, and possibly care for her on some level. After the events of the main story, she decides to seek out Nagoriyuki and offer him potential work, because that's what helped her. To explain that last point, Vylant said of those who exhibit level 2 behaviors, quote, We should not be surprised that a chronic user of a specific immature defense can often understand another user with similar problems. 
perhaps the reason that both adolescents and adults with character disorders can find love and comfort through peer self-help groups is that such groups can forgive, see through, and confront the immature defenses common to the group. The average human is not so gifted. We often condemn and thereby enhance the impregnability of immature defenses, end quote. In other words, Gio reached out to Nago because she thought no one else would just fucking get it. Alright, with all of that, it's finally time to try and understand Trigger. Though, I want to point out what the common perception of Trigger is, and for that I will use Gecko Squirrel's interpretation of the song. This isn't to call him out specifically, as his interpretation is what I've mostly seen in comments and discussion. He just put it together in the easiest-to-digest manner, so he's the unfortunate example. Geo. Geo is part of the American Defense Force. Her role in the story of Stripe is to make sure the president doesn't die. Her song is about how she doesn't want to be involved with what's happening. She's got a job to do, and she's here to do it. It's nothing personal, just forget she was ever there, and move on with your life. Honestly, the fact that she doesn't want to be part of anything might explain why her theme is pretty different from everyone else's. While most of the themes in the game go for a heavier rock aesthetic, Geo's theme just sounds like the Beastie Boys. That's it. I wish I had more to say about it, but apart from the possible horny posting in the song, she literally just tells you, politely, to fuck off. To bring this back to my original claim, this is the major mistake that has been made regarding Trigger, which is, if we can see the inner thoughts of someone, then we have no reason to believe that they are lying, and thus the lyrics tell us their true personality. Again, the unfortunate reality is that what one says, even to themselves, doesn't always match up with what they do or how they feel. So what is my take on Giovanna's theme, Trigger? Honestly, I believe that the song is about as honest as it can be, given the mental barriers that Gio has constructed. The song exists in that terrible bobbing point within the ocean of self-reflection known as speaking half-truths. In other words, the words spoken are not outright lies, but are not the entire truth either. Yet, the best part of Trigger, as a whole, is that those half-truths tend to fall apart the more they are said, and I believe that how the lyrics and music are designed reflects this. As the song goes on, the lyrics become more hasty in attempting to cover up the potential weaknesses, and the music starts to become more discordant and disconnected. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's hear the first verse. Alright, so the lyrics give us a good idea of where this song is starting from. She's leaving somebody, we'll never see them again, and apparently they don't want to. It sounds simple, it sounds straightforward, and it explains the point where the rest of the song is coming from. Uh, bad interaction, and she's off on her own again. And it's okay because nobody is to blame for her fate. But that jump from, well, I, I guess they didn't like me too much to, eh, fuck it, it's fate, is the part that I find most interesting in this verse. To me, this is likely the first basic defense she has. In particular, the invocation of fate as the reason for the interaction going poorly is where I believe the, the first crack of her mask becomes apparent. It's not that she can be an asshole, and it's not that she might have stepped on some toes. It, it's just the whim of destiny. She's okay because it's not her fault, it's fate's fault. Uh, the other line that I find interesting is the stop beating around the bush, which implies that something was not being said outright. My belief is that even though the previous interaction went poorly, it ended on some level of congeniality, which ticked off Geo. She knows they don't want to deal with her, but they won't say it outright, so she feels like she's being lied to. Given that the most repeated line in Trigger is, keep it real, then this is obviously a sore point for her. 
While the fate comment could be seen as Geo isolating herself from her own choices, then the beating around the bush line seems like she is the one who is isolating from the last person she talked to. After all, if the other person was honest enough to not beat around the bush, then why wouldn't they be the ones to tell her to fuck off? They don't want to see her, but they were lying, at least according to Geo. Which means that it's more likely Geo is the one deciding that they won't see each other again. After the first verse, we get the chorus, but we'll deal with that after the second verse, which almost seems like a direct response to the first. Now, here's where the focus changes in the most interesting manner. It, the previous idea was to say that she's okay because it's not her fault or anybody's fault. She acts the way she does. That's just fate. But then the very next thing she says is to say not to get her wrong because she won't hate herself and that holding a grudge would remove her capacity to love. I've seen professional Percurus do slower turnarounds than that. To follow that up, she immediately states that she loves her choices, and more importantly, that she could have quit, implying that she understands that she could have made a different choice. We are seeing in full display just how quickly Geo changes her justification when thinking about her relationship with other people. She starts by saying that they actually hate her, and they won't be honest about it, and says that she isn't responsible for how things go because nobody's to blame for my fate. Then she immediately turns around and says that actually she's in complete control and that she chose to act that way and even loves how she acts because in an effort to emotionally distance herself from others, she says that she is just cold, unfeeling, immovable, and impenetrable metal. The crack that we are seeing in the previous chorus is now bigger, as she's haphazardly attempting to justify herself. She's begun to contradict herself, and she knows it. So we've gone from isolating from others, to isolating from her choices, to now categorizing herself as something inhuman and impersonal in order to emotionally isolate from the consequences of her actions. The need for everything to be okay is progressing into dangerous territory, and we can see why she does this through the chorus. I, do I, don't Clearly, Geo is very caught up on the need for honesty, and she's very proud of the fact that she is straightforward about herself, not wanting to be fake. Except, with the concept of the previous two verses, we can see that this is not exactly the truth of what's happening, but more of a mantra that she tells herself. In fact, this may be the very heart of what causes her not so social behavior. This is pure speculation, but I believe that her definition of honesty here is what is skewed from others. Take the badge discussion with her boss. She hasn't earned the badge, in her words, because it looks stupid. Sure, she may be honest about how she feels about the design, but that isn't the point, which is what her boss was trying to ask in the first place. Why hasn't she earned that badge, even though she is more than capable of doing so? That was the heart of the question, but she moved away from the core issue of capability and went straight to design. Again, it's the truth, but it's a truth that's avoiding the other potential truth she was being asked for. In my belief, Geo is constantly obsessed with honesty, but is incapable of seeing her own attempts to avoid honesty, specifically because she decides to hide it within a warped sense of honesty itself. She answers all of the hard questions with jokes and with answers which are honest but derisive that avoid the heart of the problem. 
In other words, Gio is constantly avoiding what hurts her, but is stuck in the idea that she is more honest than anybody else. She's the type of person who would tell you, I don't mince my words, I tell you how it is. And then will laugh and wave off any question that might expose her to vulnerability. And what is that vulnerability? Well, the subchorus actually gives us just a small glimpse, and it is where the mask is pulled away just enough to guess what lies beneath. I wanna just be a tree girl with a brutish impulse. Tree girl, the silent preacher. Watch out, keep your hands up. Don't make a big deal out of me. Tree girl, don't be curious about me. I don't want you to get hurt. Watch out, keep your hands up. Don't make a big deal out of me. The most telling aspect of this is that the first line starts with the words, I want, rather than what could have been, I am. The first two verses give us a good example of the myriad defense mechanisms that Geo employs, and just how quickly she will change her focus to avoid facing the consequences of her actions. Here though, with the start of the subchorus stating that she wants, we've moved from saying what she believes she is to what she desires. In particular, she is asking just to be the gun of the Secret Service. She doesn't need to talk, she doesn't need to understand, just point her at the fucking enemy and let her run wild. When we take into fact that she's asking for others to stay away, even saying that they could get hurt if they get too close, then this line becomes all the more tragic. We get such a visceral moment of pain and alienation, and her reaction to such vulnerability is to tell others to back the fuck off and not make a big deal out of her. For such a simple moment, we are not looking at Geo, the cold-blooded and crass member of the Secret Service. Rather, it's an almost childlike fear of strangers putting their hands on her. To compound that tragedy, we are suddenly faced with an explosion of discordant, almost feral guitar riffs and bass lines, none of which seem to match up with one another. Then suddenly, it all collapses, and we get the most tragic part, where she puts the defenses up again. Whatever portion of the mask has been cracked before is suddenly put back together, and every little moment where Gia lets out some of the pain she is holding is interrupted with the words, never mind. What felt like an honest and painful call for help suddenly collapsed, as the cracks that were forming were suddenly replaced with an entirely new wall. In one moment, Gio closed off the world again, and then proceeded to tell the listener that it was just some fucking fantasy. She is no longer cold, distant metal, as she was claiming before, but instead dirty to begin with. Clearly, whatever life of sin she had led before has not truly escaped her, as it still projects barriers to this day. The rest of the song is mostly repeated from here on, but there is one portion that gives us another insight to this new wall she's constructed. You know sound beast don't live in her chest like that. I don't need you to believe. Freak out with the brutish impulse. Freak out the silent preacher. Now her defenses have changed. Before, she was stating what she was to try and justify her behavior, but now she is moving away from that. The new wall she built is based on a strong sense of individuality that seeks to separate itself from the pack. What's even more telling is that the I want has been dropped from the subchorus. She no longer wants to be a trigger, but has now adopted the persona with all the consequences to come. To summarize, Trigger, as it appears to me, is a song that is the temporary breakdown of the mental defenses of someone who has clearly gone through hell. As it progresses, the cracks form, and we begin to see the true pain that lies underneath. Yet the real tragedy is that the 
sudden barrier is erected partway through. When we get a simple glimpse into the true face of Geo, she shuts it down, only to tell us that she's fine, and the walls become that much harder to break through. I don't know what Daisuke plans to do with Geo in the future, but for now, she's still just that crass, irreverent agent that won't get close to anybody. Alright, at this point, I hope that the viewer may see Trigger through a different light, and maybe even Geo herself, as the story of Guilty Gear moves forward. Now, I have said multiple times that this is simply my interpretation of Geo as a character, and I would like to stress that this is likely not the definitive outlook one should take. Look over the material yourself and come to your own conclusion. The other line that I find interesting is the stop beating around the bush, which implies that... <laughs> Knocking stuff over. 